All right, let's read Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. Reading from the King James. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and that they are great exercise authority upon them. And, and they that are great exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. So Jesus is giving us a comparison. He says, the Gentiles, these unbelievers, he's using an example. Matthew writing about Jesus, he's writing to the Jewish readers. So he'll use the word Gentiles a lot. Unlike in Mark, you may see the word Gentile, but you will not see it emphasized as much as Matthew. Because Matthew, the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to Matthew, was specifically writing to the Jewish reader. So that's why we read various things. And then we have Mark, where Matthew has 28 chapters specifically dealing with Jew, the Jewish traditions, Jewish customs. Then you have Mark, he was writing, John Mark was writing to the Gentile reader, Gentile here. So there's, it's short and it's con more condensed in 16 chapters. Then we have the gospel of Jesus according to Luke. He was writing from a clinical or a physician's perspective. So it's more detailed. So you have these long chapters, uh, 64 verses in some chapters or you know, around 50 to 60 some verses in a chapter. And then we have John, the gospel of Jesus according to John. And John is writing from a more uh, intimate relationship with Jesus. So he gives us a description of Jesus like no other writer how that Jesus is the water of life, how Jesus is the word, how Jesus is the good shepherd, how Jesus is the door. So that's how the breakdown of the gospels are written. So going back to Matthew, when he says here, the Gentiles, that's what he's referring to, okay? So verse 26, but it shall be, it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great, among you, let him be your minister. And before I move on, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, we thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor for this time, this opportunity to share your word. I pray, Lord, that our ears are open and our hearts are ready to receive what the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost has for us in our lives as it relates to a daily reminder. We know that the Holy Spirit, he brings to our remembrance. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would bring to each of our remembrance on a daily basis what our purpose is for that day. That purpose, that reason for our existence in God and help us to be intentional to fulfill our purpose and God's will in our lives. Let us continue to read. In Christ's name, we say amen. And for those who are hearing and they don't know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit ministers to their heart and let them know that Jesus' purpose for coming into the world was for them. He died and shed his blood for them. And I pray that they intentionally seek, search, seek and search a relationship with him. And that's through accepting him as their personal Lord and Savior, being born again and washed by his blood. That is our prayer, Lord, for those who will hear. And we'll give you the praise, glory and honor in Christ, your name. Amen. Back to Matthew chapter 20. Verse 27, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be servant. He's writing about humility, but he's also writing about how to walk, how to live in serving God, in doing ministry, as people call it today. In doing ministry, he's letting us know how to do it in humility. No big eyes and little use. 
So he says in verse 27, whoever or who, whosoever will be chief among you, let him also be your servant. Verse 28, even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, not to be served, the word minister or the word minister means to serve. Ministry is a service. So it says the son of man, the son of humanity, Jesus Christ, he came not to be served, but to minister, to serve, and ultimately to give his life as a ransom. Again, speaking to you about a daily reminder. Brothers and sisters, this should be a daily reminder to us when it comes to our service to God, when it comes to the ministry. I really believe that just through my exposure and people I know and the people I talk to, the word ministry and, and to minister has been to a degree contaminated. Uh, rescripted from the true meaning. And we find out the true meaning by our supreme example, who is Jesus. And he makes a statement here in Matthew 28, or 20 and 28, also found in Mark, as well as Luke, I believe it is. And Jesus said, I came not to be ministered unto I didn't come for people to serve me. What was he saying? He was saying, I came because I have the answers for mankind. I came because I'm, I'm bringing to them what they need. They have nothing for me. He said, I didn't come to be ministered unto, but I came to serve. I came to minister. And ultimately, I'm going to give my life. I'm going to give my life as a ransom for all those that I came for. I'm going to do something that no one else could possibly do. I'm going to give my life as a ransom. Brothers and sisters, this should be a daily reminder. It's not just about one day out of the year, Easter. It's not just about Christmas time. It should be a daily reminder that Jesus came and gave his life as a ransom for us. This is a reminder to every one of us of his purpose. His reason for coming was not to be served by the disciples and by people. His reason for coming to the earth in human form was not to debate and argue with the religious men of the day. It was not to, to come and establish another kingdom or empire in the eyes of man. But his purpose was to come and to minister, to serve the people, to show them and manifest to them the love of God. Not just to talk about the love of God, but to actually show them the love of God. And to ultimately give his life as a ransom. We're talking about love here. We're talking about being reminded on a daily ba basis the purpose that Jesus came. The purpose he came was because he loved us. And he was intentional. He was purposed to fulfill 
his father's will. What was his father's will? We read it in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him or believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Brothers and sisters, we all were born into sin. We all were shaping in iniquity. We all were perishing. We were lost. We were perishing. But because of the Lord's purpose, because of his reason for coming, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, made in this flesh. God sent forth his son. There was a reason he came. He was purposed. He purposed in his heart to, a, to fulfill his father's will. That's love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's love. And it's that same love that Jesus manifest when he was here on earth. He tells us to have that same love. In John chapter 13, he tells us, he says, here's the, this commandment I give you. A new commandment. It wasn't new. It was the same. But it was new to them. And it was new to us. Why was it new? It was new because as we look at the words that he shares, he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. So that's not new. The Bible tells in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there's nothing new under the sun, right? So the commandment to love one another was not a new commandment in itself. Let's continue in that scripture. He said, I want you to love one another. Here's the new part. As I have loved you. I have physically come down. I am physically with you. I have shown you in the physical how to love. How to love sacrificially, sacrificially, excuse me. How to love unselfishly. This was the this was the new part to that commandment. Not to love one another. That's always been there. But Jesus says, the way I have shown you, the way I have loved you, I have shown you, I have left you an example by the love that I have for you. He says, I also want you to love one another. There's the emphasis. And he said, by this, not the way you define love, not the way he defines love, not the way she defines love, but I want you to love one another with agape, divine love. That's what I love you with. And that agape, divine love sent him to the cross. That divine and agape love kept him on the cross. That divine and agape love put him in the grave for three days and three nights. That divine agape love resurrected him. That divine agape love did what? It caused him to present his sinless, his stainless, his spotless blood to the Father, his sin. And he said, Father, it's through this. Or we, we read that from the sinless, spotless, stainless blood, he said, it's through this. Will the grace of God be established and whosoever will be able to come to me and know that I am the God of 
mankind. I am the savior of their soul. Every man, every woman, every child will have an opportunity to have eternal life. That's agape love. Agape love. Agape love says, I didn't come to be ministered unto. But agape love says, I came to minister. I came to serve. And I am willing to sacrifice. That's agape love. So he says, this new commandment I give you, that you love one another, but I want you to love one another the way I've loved you. I want you to pray one for another the way I pray for you. I want you to serve one another the way I serve you. I want you to be examples of me the way I left you an example to follow. Because it's through that that all men and women, the world, regardless of their religion, regardless of their gender, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their race, Love is a universal language. Love is an action word. And men and women will know that, hey, that man, that woman, they're a follower of me. They're a follower of Jesus. It's not because they're eloquent with their words. It's not because they've been to the best Bible colleges and Bible seminaries. It's not because they can quote scriptures. It's not because they know biblical uh, church history and biblical history. It's not because they have a strong concordance. They have a Dakes Phineas Bible. They have a Thompson Chain Bible. It's not because they read the King James. It's because of the love of God that's in their heart. It's not because of the car they drive or the house they live in or the financial prosperity they may um uh, be living at it's because of the love that they have one for another jesus said that's how people will know let this be a daily reminder to us and let us purpose to love men and women with a gop with agape love the way jesus loved them and that love doesn't just mean doing it means praying a daily reminder to pray for one another. You don't need to know situations and know the details, but we do know that we're all dealing with situations. I may not know the details of your situation. I may not know the details of your mental state. I don't know the details of your spiritual state. I don't know the details of your life but I know you need to be prayed for. I know I need to be prayed for. I know there's a great need. I know that prayer is the vital source of living for God and serving God and, and serving men and women. Jesus said, I didn't come to be ministered unto. I didn't come to be waited upon. I didn't come for y'all to bow down to me and do all these things for me. I came to serve y'all. I came to show y'all an example. I came to show y'all what the love of God really looks like. And I think that's been contaminated within congregations. I don't want to say church because the church is the body of Christ. But within congregations, people are waiting to be served. Those in the ministry, those with position, those who have titles, waiting to be served. Pull out my seat for you. Let me park your car for you. Let me shine your shoes. Let me do all these things. Wait a minute. The ministry has been redefined, if that's the case, according to what Jesus said. So what's my purpose there? It doesn't matter how long I've served God. And people do things for us, right? People do things for us. Why? There are a number of reasons. They may do it because of their love for God. And then on the flip side, the more negative side, I say negative side, people do it out of cultural obligation. What does cultural obligation mean? Here's a little bit of psychology for you. Cultural obligation because 
I was raised in the church, raised around the church, and I saw this one doing it. I saw my mama doing it. I saw my grandmama doing it. I saw this one way, you know, and it's a cultural thing. It's a traditional thing. So my whole purpose, one's whole purpose is based on cultural experiences versus the love of God. See, the love of God causes action. It causes action that's led by the Holy Spirit. So therefore, there's no bitterness. There's no, well, I got to go to church and go do this. I got to go clean the church because if I don't, then something's going to be said and this is going to happen. And now that becomes a burden. There's no joy in that. There is no singing while I'm sweeping the floor or mopping the floor. But when you're doing it because you love God and you're doing it as unto the Lord, now you're sweeping the floor, mopping the floor, cooking, preparing, doing all these things because of the agape love that's in you. So now you're singing and make a melody in your heart while you're working for God and you're fulfilling that your purpose See, brothers and sisters, when we're fulfilling our purpose in God on a daily basis, the joy of God comes with that. Let us be reminded. He says, in thy presence, the psalmist speaking, is fullness of joy. How do we experience God's presence? Getting in our purpose. Being reminded of our purpose. That Colossians 3 whatsoever ye do, Colossians 3, 23, I believe it is, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, wholeheartedly as unto the Lord, and not unto men as men pleasers. Because our purpose is to serve God. Our purpose is to wait on the Lord, and he will direct our steps. Amen? He says, those who wait on the Lord shall be renewed by the Lord. They shall mount up with wings, right? So as we do it as unto the Lord with agape love, and if you really want to define agape love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, read all 13 verses of that chapter, then go over to 1 John chapter 4, start reading in verse 5, 6, 7, and it talks... Those, those two places give us a good discord on love. Then John 13, 34, 35 as well. So he said, by this, John 13, 35, all men will know that we are your disciples. Agape love. And brothers and sisters, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 5, that love, that agape love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. He says, the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart and my heart by the Spirit of God. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are in agreement that they're going to pour that agape love in you and I. So that that agape love will inspire us, will motivate us to do all things in the name of the Lord, and therefore men and women will see our purpose and they will see the love that we have one for another and they'll be drawn to Jesus. They'll be drawn to Jesus. The Bible also says when we were talking about agape love, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14, he says, let all your things be done with charity. Let all your things be done with Charity, agape love, agape love. Let that be a reminder. As you define in prayer with God what your purpose is that he's called you to do, do it with agape divine love. It's been shed abroad in your heart. And if it hasn't been shed abroad in your heart, come to Jesus and the Holy Spirit at salvation. He'll shed in your heart the love of God and you'll fall in love with Jesus more and more on a daily basis. And your actions, your speech, our actions, our speech will be more like Jesus, not a forced thing. 
not a forced thing because someone who has a title, not a forced thing because of cultural obligation or traditional obligation. No, we'll go to church, we'll serve in the church, we'll serve the communities because of the divine love that's been shed abroad in our hearts. Let's move on. Agape love, let that be a daily reminder as we look at our purpose. And as we look at our purpose and we have that divine love, we move into a space of influence and impact. So agape divine love that's been shed abroad in our hearts when we have that right mental frame we're doing all things as unto the Lord. We're doing all things, let all your things be done with charity. We're doing all these things because the love of God's been shed abroad in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, we're going to be influential. And in being influential, we're going to have an impact. Notice Jesus dealing with influence and impact. When Jesus was on the boat with his disciples, and the storms was raging and the water was slamming up against it. And, and the disciples were so afraid and so scared. And they, Jesus is at the bottom of the ship. And the disciples said, don't you care that we perish? Don't you love us enough to save us? Agape love, divine love. Jesus gets up. Jesus comes to the top of the ship. Many of us know the story. Mark chapter 4, verse 39. 41 and other places in the gospels jesus rebukes the wind and and said unto the sea so he rebukes the elements right and he rebukes this powerful source called water this body of water this sea the sea of galilee and the wind that was blowing the water to slap against the sides of the boat and saturate the boat with all the sea water and jesus said peace be still because of his love, he was influential with the wind, with the sea, and with the people. He said, peace be still, and the winds ceased or stopped. And there was great calm. There's impact. There was great calm, not just with the wind, not just on the sea, but there was great calm with the disciples. It was because he loved them. And brothers and sisters, that divine agape love in our hearts will contribute to great influence and impact in the hearts and the lives of those God allow us to be exposed to. Be it family members, those in our home, be it those our neighbors, be it those within our community, be it those people we help. It'll be about influence and impact. Jesus' influence and impact. We I shared it with you, Mark chapter 4. Our influence and impact. Let's look at Jude. Jude chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. It's only one chapter in Jude. Let me read it. He said, and of some, well, first of all, we can go back up. And he says, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Asking for a leading, asking for guidance, asking for direction, asking God, fulfill your purpose in me through the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, goes on in Jude chapter 1, verse 22, and he says, and of some dealing with people now. So after we built ourselves up on our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, he says what? Now. Have compassion, verse 22. And on some, have compassion, making a difference. So allow that compassion, that love of God to bring us into a space of influence and impact. Having compassion on people to where that we make a positive difference in their lives. And others, verse 23, save them with fear, pulling them out. There's the action part of love. Pulling them out of the fire. Yes, I hate 
the garment that's been spotted by sin, but I love the soul that Jesus died for. So we have agape, we have influence, we have impact, AI, AI, I. And now we have ministry. What is the ministry? And I have a whole teaching. You can go to the website and I have the whole teaching on ministry, probably about seven, eight different lessons taught years ago, saved them on YouTube. So go look at it. Understanding the ministry, understanding the minister. I'm not going to go through all of it. It's all recorded there. You can go access it at any time. Just go under Bible studies, I believe. Go to uh, agapeunity.org or agapecommunitychristian.org or go to the website and just go to Bible studies, I believe, or podcast, one of the two. It's there. Understanding the ministry, understanding the minister. And I talk about what the ministry is, what, what it means to be a minister. We're all ministers, all right? Everyone who is saved is a minister. Not me. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're a minister for God. What did Jesus say? Going back up to Matthew 20, verse 28, he said, I, I came not to be ministered unto. So he's looking at the disciples and he says, you guys are ministering unto me. So therefore, they are ministers trying to minister unto Jesus. Jesus said, but I came to minister. He never had a title. Did anyone ever call him pastor? They called him rabbi, rabboni, but that was titles of the day, right? Religious men. But we're all ministers. If you are saved, if you are a Christian, you are born again, you profess and you carry the title of a Christ-like person, you're a minister, according to the Bible. Let's look at it. Next few minutes. The Bible says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's start in verse 17. The Bible says, I just lost my train of thought. Okay, let's read it. I lost my train of thought. Maybe I shouldn't read it, right? No, I'm a, I won't start there. All right, here we go. Chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, I can put it down. Sometimes you just need that one word to start. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Notice what he said. If any man or woman, any person be in Christ, they are new creatures. Behold, open your eyes, your spiritual eyes. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So that's inclusive of everyone. Everyone who comes to Christ. Then the next verse, he goes on and he says in verse 18, and all things and all people are of God who have reconciled. Now, what that means is that all things, all people have been created by God as a, as a result of God's purpose, right? Not everyone is serving God, but as a result of their very existence is because God created mankind. So he says in verse 18, all things are of God. All people are of God who have reconciled us to himself, restored us to himself by Jesus Christ, his son, which we've been talking about. And here it is. And have given to us, all of us, the ministry or the service of reconciliation or restoration. Every one of you on the sound of my voice who are a believer in Christ, a Christian, whether you recognize it or not, realize it or not, you are a minister of the gospel. We are to, you are to serve the gospel to men and women, not just to receive it. Now, we do want to receive it. He said, be not just a hearer of the word, but also a doer of the word. So we, re we do receive it. We receive it so that we can deliver it. 
We can't deliver something that we haven't received. I can't be a blessing to someone if I have nothing to be a blessing to give them to be a blessing with. So I must be something before I can do something. I must have something before I can give something. So God is giving us his word because we are ministers and we are to minister to serve his word to family, to neighbors, to coworkers, serving his word to men and women. Why? Because his word, the essence of his word is to reconcile to restore souls to him. So whether you realize it or not, you have a ministry. You have a ministry and it's called the Ministry of Reconciliation. And everything about the ministry, the church, the way the church should operate, the way congregations should operate, should operate, whether they're doing that or not, that's for them. That's between them and God. The way it should operate should be all geared around the reconciliation of souls. Draw, the music should be drawing men and women in. The music that's being played shouldn't be seductive music to be to be to have men and women thinking about sexual activities. It, it shouldn't be to be cool and hip hop and all these things. The music should be geared towards reconciliation, restoring souls to God. The activities, the events, everything should be pointing to restoration, reconciliation. If not, then it's not a ministry for Jesus. Because he says he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. So whether a person's in the music ministry, that music should be drawing people to God. Whether they're in hospitality uh, ministry, it should be to draw people to God. Whether it's the preaching ministry, it should be to proclaim and preach the word of God, to draw people to God. Whatever the ministry might be, as people call it, the ministry, the service, it should all be under the umbrella to draw souls to Jesus. So there you have it. A-I-M, agape, influential ministry, service. That's our purpose. And that's our purpose. And that's a daily reminder. God, let me do this. Whatever I'm doing, whatever ministry, however I'm serving, be it over someone's house, just spending time. I love going over people's homes, just spending time and just talking and fellowship. And I love it. That service and being of service, if I can, be it a Bible study or just counseling or just, just whatever it might be, the ministry, doing it with agape love, doing it to influence and to have a positive impact. So there we have the acronym AIM, Agape Influential Ministry. And that word AIM, even though this is an acronym, the word AIM is the target. What's the target? The target is the souls of men and women. The target is your salvation and the salvation of souls. Let that be a daily reminder because ultimately, brothers and sisters, that's our purpose. That's our purpose. I talk to many of people and some want to go back and forth and Bible debate and Bible history and all these different things. And I shared the other day with some, I said, yeah, we're talking about Revelation and on and on. But if it's not to produce evangelism and to reach out and make a difference to souls, it's all in vain. It's just knowledge. We have to do something with the knowledge that we gain in God. And that is to what? There should be a target, a daily target. Let this be a daily reminder. There should be a target, an aim for why you're coming to church why you're on this platform, why you're listening to YouTube, why you're attending in the, in the physical building, not just to go through the motions. There should be a target, spiritual development, spiritual growth. But with that spiritual growth, my purpose is to share that with men and women that they may be reconciled and restored to God. We live in a world, people are hurting. You don't need me to say it. The world is hurting. The world is groaning. People are hurting. People are uncertain. I know the word, the buzz word around 
the pandemic time and COVID was uncertainty, uncertainty. There was a lot of uncertainty before the pandemic. And there's still a lot of uncertainty today. But we have the certain word of God that brings salvation, that brings joy, that brings peace, that brings assurance, that, be, that brings eternal security. We have a certainty. We know for sure that God's word does not fail. Let this be a reminder, brothers and sisters, and let this drive and inspire, motivate our purpose. I challenge you, I encourage you to continue to be in the purpose that God has you in and then purposely stay focused, intentionally stay focused on a day-to-day -day basis. You can do it. I know you can do it. I know there are many distractions. I know there are many things that happen, but you can do it. Why do I know you can do it? Why do I believe you can do it? As Douglas Perkins, I know you can do it because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. I know you can do it. Why? Because you have been created in the image and in the likeness of God. I know you can do it because God is going to help you to do it. You can do all things through Christ who's going to give you the strength. You can and you will as you purpose on a daily basis, the Holy Spirit will remind you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise and magnify you today. We give you the glory and we give you the honor, Lord. It's because of all that you've done, Jesus, that agape love, divine love, took you to the cross, resurrected you from the grave, and now you're on the right hand of the throne of high. And that agape love is still causing you to make intercession for us daily. That agape love that you displayed here on this earth for us has influenced us to come to know you as a personal savior. It has impacted our lives every day. You've given us a sound mind. You've given us love. You told us there's no need to fear. You've put in our hearts a reason for being. Your agape love, Lord Jesus, for us has and continues to influence and impact our lives. And you've given us a ministry to follow. The ministry of reconciliation. You've given us a target an aiming point that we, in the event we go astray, we can come back to. You've given us the ministry of reconciliation, of restoration. And you've called us and you've placed us within the body, the spiritual body of Christ, the church, to fulfill, to purposely, intentionally fulfill those offices that you place us in. We thank you. We thank you that we have aim. We thank you that we have a target. We thank you for the agape love. We thank you for divine influence and divine impact. We thank you for the divine ministry of reconciliation. Remind us, every one of us, and we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In your wonderful name, Lord Jesus, we say amen and amen. God bless you all. Those who are on YouTube Live, let me just remind you, share this link with others, forward it to others, look at the channel if you like, subscribe to it so that you'll get the reminders when we put out another sermon or another Bible study. So if this is your way of viewing us, um, that's a blessing. We want to do what God would have for us to do, to share this glorious gospel with as many people, as many people as we possibly can. All those who have logged on to Zoom, thank you all for being with us. Pray for us. Pray one for another. All righty. So God bless you all. And those on YouTube Live, be blessed, be encouraged. All right.